This is CUNY TV, the City University of New York. Stephanie, por favor, te la escuela. Tómate para que te veas la escuela. Escuela, 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 escuela. Bienvenidos a Nueva York, un programa dedicado a la cultura hispanoparlante La Gran Manzana, celebrando su riqueza, diversidad y contribuciones a la vida de esta ciudad. En este episodio presentamos el documental de nuestra colega de CUNY TV, Sarah Porat, I Am Not Alone, No Estoy Sola. La historia narra su proceso de incertidumbre, reconocimiento y esfuerzo cuando fue diagnosticada con cáncer del seno. A continuación, Jenny Santiago, codirectora de Latina Share, una organización de apoyo a las mujeres latinas con este tipo de cáncer, nos introduce a este impactante testimonio audiovisual. Hola, soy Jenny Santiago, codirectora del programa Latina Share de Share. Una de cada ocho mujeres será diagnosticada con cáncer de seno en sus vidas. Para las mujeres latinas, es el cáncer más comúnmente diagnosticado. Le puede pasar a usted, su hermana, a su madre, amiga o vecina. A mí me pasó, pero hoy soy sobreviviente de cáncer de seno por 10 años. Les invitamos a ver este importante documental, I'm Not Alone, No Estoy Sola, de la productora de CUNY TV, Sara Porath, sobre su experiencia con el cáncer del seno y cómo se enteró que no estaba sola y podía hacerle frente a esta enfermedad. I'm a uh, television producer for CUNY TV. I used to be afraid of dying when I uh, first got the diagnosis um, of breast cancer. Breast cancer has always frightened me. When I was growing up, almost everyone I knew that, that got it actually died from it. I was more than fearful. I was really phobic about cancer, and specifically breast cancer. I thought I was protected from it because it was not in my family. And I was, you know, did everything according to what the magazines and books said. And I had my annual mammogram. So um, I really felt that I was really protected. I really wanted to stay as far away from the pink ribbon as I could. Last June, I had my regular annual uh, mammogram, and truthfully, I was going to uh, postpone it. I really thought, look, look, what's the big deal if I postpone it? You know, I'm not in the group that's going to get breast cancer. But uh, luckily, I said to myself, if I postpone it, it's going to be several months after that. And I went in, and they found something. I had to go back for another a mammogram, and then they said biopsy, which is very frightening, and they did a biopsy. And then you get the phone call that, you know, every woman is, is uh, most afraid of getting. Um, I was really scared out of my mind. I was really afraid of, um, of dying. I realized I really needed to learn more about what was happening to me. I began a whole process for me, a whole journey for me. But I learned I was not alone. Now, the Making Strides Walk was the first uh, uh, event that I covered after I learned I had breast cancer. This is the one of the major walks where uh, breast cancer survivors go to. I knew nothing about these walks, and all of a sudden I'm going on the Mo Making Strides um, website, and then they say, you know, to learn about teams, 
put in put in words, I put in CUNY, and all of a sudden I see like 15 teams from different schools pop up. Uh, I can stand a breast cancer survivor going to it. What I really was interested in is why were there so many CUNY students and, fa and staff uh, going to it. But I, I really didn't know whether I was going to be up for it because I had just started my radiation and it was also a horribly cold and rainy day. But uh, uh, everything everything worked out. It's, it's really shocking to see uh, people's outpouring of, of happiness and, and community. Some of us here today feel a special connection to this. Some of us have, you know, family members that are survivors of breast cancer, other types of cancer. I have a friend actually whose uh, mother is uh, going through breast cancer right now. She's having the chemotherapy and it's, uh, I, when I see my friend cry, like, that made me want to go here even more. The reason I'm walking today is really because um, this is the first year we're walking without Barbara. And so this is very significant for us this year. When I first met her, I had no idea she had breast cancer because she was always happy and she always walked about strong. And so it's kind of rainy today, it's damp, it's dreary, but uh, you know, Barbara would never complain. You know, if she left anything, she left an example. We have so many different organizations involved, our corporates, our universities like CUNY, our government offices, our hospitals, our health related, and they're the leaders. We look for people who are interested in the issue of breast cancer. And in turn, those people in places like CUNY, they, they get together with their colleagues, they bring their family, their friends, and they're all committed to the fight against breast cancer, and they are coming out and they're supporting the American Cancer Society, and we thank them so much for that. I think we've had at least 15 to 16 schools here, uh, from the community colleges to senior colleges all over. I met Carl Ailman, the Director of Student Affairs at Brew College, who's been involved in the past 15 Making Strides walks, and Wilhelmina Obertola Grant, a Hunter alumnus and a breast cancer survivor. And I really want to learn more about their personal journeys. I really want to see what I can learn from it. I'm Wilhelmina Obertola Grant. I'm a visual artist. I do mixed media assemblage art, and I use found objects to do that. That was a picture of health, I was exercising, eating well, I was really a health nut and I didn't think that I would be a candidate for breast cancer but when I was 37 I was very active in karate, I took karate classes three times a week and when I was sparring one night I got hit on the breast and um, it wasn't a regular punch like I would usually feel because it just was such a sharp pain and it, never, it didn't go away after that. And for a month I kept having throbbing pains. So I went to a clinic to see what was causing the pain and I was told it was probably just a cyst. And since I didn't have a family history of breast cancer, since I was an African American woman, since I was young, I was under 40, and since it was a painful lump that it couldn't be cancer. And I was in so much pain, I went to another place because I said, even if it's not cancer, I didn't think it was cancer, but even if it's not, it's something and I want to stop hurting. <laughs> so I went to another location and they did a mammogram, which the other place refused me because I was under 40. It was a very small uh, primary tumor, but it had already spread to the lymph nodes in my armpit, so it was pretty severe. I was uh, staged at 2A which is there's four stages of breast cancer and I was two and a half, like two A. So it was pretty severe. The second time on that left side where I had the lumpectomy, my annual mammogram showed something that was a little suspicious. So they did a biopsy and I had the, the very beginning of another breast cancer, but it was stage zero. 
um, which is when you want to find it before it has spread anywhere. And so I had a mastectomy um, because it was the same breast and they were going to do another procedure and I had very, very small breasts. So I decided to go ahead and have a mastectomy without reconstruction and without um, any of those other procedures. Once I realized what was going on and how I, what I had to do to get through it, I applied what I was doing to help me get through it. So I was a karate person, so when I had chemotherapy, I kept visualizing the droplets coming down in the IV, that they were little karate people punching the cancer cells out. So that helped me get through. I'm Carl Ailman. I'm Director of Student Life here at Baruch College. I've been at Baruch for 32 years. When cancer affects the family, I think it affects everybody in the family. I don't think it's just the patient that's involved, whether it's male or female involved. I think it affects everybody. So the one thought that went through my head was, gee, I don't want to lose my wife. I love her and I don't want, want to see what life's going to be like without her. Um, and we had a very good doctor at Sloan Kettering. She was very good about helping me as well as my wife cope with it. When we, she was showing us what the situation was and uh, put the mammogram up on the uh, screen to look at, she had given my wife a magnifying glass so she can point out what the problems were. And then when she was finished explaining it to my wife, she took the magnifying glass, gave it to me, and showed, did the exact same thing to me. And I realized at that point what she was basically saying is it's not only her, it's you too. She had a mastectomy and breast reconstruction simultaneously and then began the recovery period after that. We kind of thought of it in a lot of ways as a cathartic, therapeutic kind of thing. You know, if life gives you lemons, make lemonade out of it. It was sort of our, our kind of attitude. I believe that it was because of a routine mammogram, early detection, and treatment by a superb doctor that I stand here today, a 15-year breast cancer survivor, and I am well and fighting back. I have a daughter. She's uh, 22 years old. She just graduated from, from college. I talked to my network of friends who told me what they talked to their daughters about, and I learned also to ask my breast surgeon what I should say. So I learned what to say, all these things I should be saying to her, and, and it, 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 went, did it, it went well. It sounds, like it, it's, it sounds funny that it went well, but it did go well when I did talk to her about it. I mean, I, I am lucky. I, I was in the earlier stages of, of breast cancer, so I could tell her a, a, you know, the good story. I don't know what would have happened if I had had stage four. I mean, I think that would have been a lot different I think the biggest strength I had was really coming from my husband. He was so supportive and there uh, for me. He was there with all my crazy fears and, and that, I, that I went through. So uh, I'm very, very lucky that I had him. That he was very supportive of what, of what I was going through. You know, this is really the first time I came so so directly close to to cancer and before it was a scary word and all kinds of terrifying images but now it really became a uh, situation where uh, I was directly involved and uh, someone I love very much was directly involved and that that really changed things that the, 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 the fear factor went way up uh, initially and then uh, I think the relief as we began to see that there were, there were treatment options, that uh, we had caught the disease early, that uh, there were many things that could be done to, to both uh, stop the disease now and to prevent it from uh, reoccurring or spreading. Um, this became really important to us and, and cancer really, in my own perception, moved from this, this horrible, deadly uh, plague to something that you deal with and you, you live with and you, uh, you address and, and you overcome. I went to see my gynecologist uh, once a year where the, uh, the doctor uh, does a breast examination and I went for my routine mammogram but I 
Um, I wouldn't do anything else. I mean, I would never do breast self-examinations. Uh, I really didn't go that next step, and I should have gone that next step, but I did not. Truthfully, <laughs> I thought that uh, uh, with having breast cancer and being checked so much, I would still, I thought at this point, I wouldn't have to do any more breast self-examination, but guess what? My doctor says I still have to do it. So it's something that everyone has to do. But to my surprise, self-breast examination workshops are happening on CUNY campuses, and they are actually saving the lives of many young women. And I wish I had had something like that. Women who do regular self-breast exams find lumps this size. Women who don't do self-breast exams at all, this is the size lump that gets found. Today we're providing information about breast cancer awareness, how to detect breast cancer, and there's actually a registered nurse giving breast cancer exams. I think it's something that you can't exchange for your life, so I wanted to be a part of that. At my station, uh, we have this accordion of, of pictures to show uh, visuals of how to do the breast uh, self-exam. And then if they have time, they can sit for the video as well, which is a more in-depth look at the actual procedure and different methods of doing it. This is great. I just came by and I saw the whole breast cancer thing and I got really interested in I've never have had any examination of myself and this was kind of like a wake-up call. This is um, the hands-on table and at this table we're actually giving the students a chance to feel two different breasts, one where they can see lumps, one where they can't. You have to try and do small spaces and multiple circles at different levels of pressure and a chance to actually feel a breast that um, tells them where the lumps are but feels more like a realistic human breast. You feel that one at the bottom, right? It's a larger lump. It's almost grape-sized. I have a 28-year-old cousin who survived breast cancer, and so that just showed me that it doesn't matter if you are older, you can be younger as well and still be at risk for getting breast cancer. So this was very important, learning that, seeing that, that was the difference. For me. Why we do this with the young students is because we want to teach them from this age that they should be self-savvy consumers of health care. And sometimes being a savvy consumer of health care is self-care. So they need to know some of the things that they could be doing that is free and of no cost to them, but will sometimes save their life. I had an instance where I was a few years ago, um, I found a lump, or the doctor found a lump on my breast. I wasn't aware of this because I didn't know how to examine myself. Everything turned out fine, but overall I should have known. Now I do. Now I can examine myself monthly, like they told me, once a week, once a month after your period. And um, I'm more informed. I feel confident now about being a woman and just, you know, breast cancer awareness. I, I, I basically went from, like, being totally phobic about reading anything that had to do with cancer to really immersing myself in the topic. I think the most important thing uh, I had to learn was that uh, most women do not die of breast cancer, um, which is totally different than what I grew up with, uh, and that scientific advances are being done every day. In fact, if I had gotten DCIS 15 years ago, um, the standard care of treatment would have been a mastectomy, uh, and now it's lumpectomy, and that's a huge difference. So things are happening all the time uh, in breast cancer research. I discovered that many CUNY campuses were doing breast cancer research from many different disciplines. Physics scientists from City College have teamed up with Morrill Sloan Kettering Cancer Center to see if they can diagnose breast cancer using near-infrared light instead of mammograms and biopsies. Environmental science researchers at the College of Staten Island are solving the mystery of why Staten Island has the highest rate of breast cancer mortality in the city. A psychology professor at the Graduate Center is studying how breast cancer survivors cope with their fears of reoccurrence. And at Hunter College, Professor Jill Barganetti is one of the top breast cancer researchers in the country for her work in the molecular genetics of breast cancer. And I really wanted to understand breast cancer from her perspective. Well, one of the things that I'm thinking about very carefully is how we can make better drugs, how we can make more targeted therapeutics. Presently, most of the therapeutics out there 
are drugs that damage the DNA. This is why people lose their hair. So if we find treatments that are more directed and more targeted to just the cancer and not hitting all the rest of the cells in the body, perhaps we can get rid of all these awful side effects during the treatment, but in addition get rid of the illnesses that occur 10, 20 years down the road. Yes, we can treat people so that after they have treatment, they're the same person they were before they had the cancer. We should feel very hopeful about the future of breast cancer research because we're learning many, many new things and we have a lot of young minds who are learning new things who are going to take this research into the future and hopefully one of the students that come out of CUNY will be the person who figures out how to treat different types of breast cancer. I'm basically over the, the worst of the treatment and now I'm on medication for the next five years, but I'm doing well with that. I almost feel like I'm on the other side of it, you know. Uh, I'm, I felt like I was on the sent to the plan of cancer, and now I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm being sent back to, to uh, uh, Earth. I would like to welcome everyone here, and thank you so much for coming out. This is a wonderful, let's start crying a, a, a wonderful culmination of a project I've been working on called, called Clock Strikes 13 because I was so touched at the number of um, women in our community who have lost their lives to breast cancer. I'm a two-time survivor. It was detected early and I want to promote early detection in the community by starting to spread awareness and education and this is the best way that I know how to do it. Someone asked me earlier what did I hope people would walk away from this exhibition with and I said well all these women who I'm highlighting in this exhibition were the first to do something that they did um, while, while they were here and they have left a legacy. So what I'm trying to do is be the first to do something that I do well and leave a legacy um, with that and that other women, people, should find something that they do well and let that be their legacy and let it be something that's going to be helpful to the community. Let it be something that is worthwhile and um, let it have something, be something that has meaning and that they really put their heart into. And I really put my heart into this. I relay from my wife, in support of my wife, Anne. I relay in support of my Peru colleagues who have fought cancer. I relay in memory of my mother-in-law, Gertie, and our good friend, Sharon. I am Carly Alman, Director of Student Life here at Peru College and welcome to our sixth annual American Cancer Relay for Life of CUNY Manhattan. Thank you for coming. You couldn't control the destiny of what was gonna happen, those are the cards that were dealt, but then how you react to it is the only thing we really can control. So I think what my wife and, and I kind of decided to do was let's take an active step in doing something, whatever little thing we can do, helped and you know it started out in little efforts of just fundraising on our own being participants in the making strides to starting to form teams that we started doing here at the college to participate in making strides over the years and then the opportunity came to bring this program straight to the college and do it right on the college campus and somehow I said this has got to be what we do next. When I'm doing the survival war a lot of things go through my mind. Certainly, having people clap for me, and it, 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 it's very emotional. Um, I even felt tears welling up a bit. I mean, these are people that I don't know. It also makes me feel very proud that I'm out here doing this. And, and I do it so that people can see survivors. When people are diagnosed with cancer, a lot of people feel that there's no hope. And that's what I, I want to convey to them, a feeling of hope, and that I am here 15 years later. Um, and I do it with gratitude because I am here 15 years later, and it's a way for me to give back, and again, to, to provide hope for people.
who find themselves in, in the same situation. I'm in a different place today. It's been a year. I got, I just got my uh, checkup, and I am cancer-free. Uh, that doesn't mean that I'm cancer-free for the rest of my life, but chances are that it's, it's looking good. And the biggest thing is I'm no longer afraid, um, and that's that's a, a huge difference because I think my fears uh, pervade not just cancer but other things in life. And uh, I really feel okay. And uh, I think I'm really even better than I was before. Para obtener más información acerca de qué hacer si usted o un ser querido tiene cáncer de seno, llame a SHARE, donde ofrecemos apoyo, información y recursos en inglés y español. Nuestro servicio es gratuito y confidencial. También puede obtener nuestra novela, Se Valiente Son Tus Senos, especialmente diseñada para la mujer latina. Y recuerde, estamos aquí para ayudarle. I brought my mom with me this time for the first time, so I'm very excited about that. <laughs> I'm a breast cancer survivor since 2003, and I've been fortunate I've been cancer free. Thank you. Congrats. Yeah, thanks so much. Really. You guys show it to your mom. So <laughs> You know, I've been blessed enough where I was poor enough to know everything and I was rich enough just to survive. There are many people that survive. Prevention is the thing, you know, get screened. You know, there's a family history, do something about it. Breast cancer doesn't define people. And that's what I tell people, Don't not, do not let it define you. Thank you. Maybe we'll save a few lives. Yes. Yes. That's so awesome.